welcome everyone to the very first uh, Constitutional Studies lecture of the fall semester. Um, it's a little unusual for us to be in this format, but we are very happy to be able to have Professor Kessler come and speak to us anyway. This lecture is given primarily towards um, one of our, our Constitutional Studies Gateway course, which is required for all the minors. Um, and so students, welcome. Everyone else, we thank you for joining us. And um, our tradition here at the program is to have one of our student fellows in the Tocqueville Fellowship Program do the introduction. So um, with that, I would like to introduce Blake Ziegler. He is a political science and economics major, is that right, or philosophy? Uh, political science and philosophy. Philosophy. Thank you. Um, so Blake, if you want to get us started. Thank you. Good afternoon. It is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Charles Kessler. Dr. Kessler is a senior fellow of the Claremont Institute, editor of the Claremont Review of Books, and the Dangler Dykema Distinguished Professor of Government at Claremont McKenna College. He also teaches in the Claremont Institute's Publius Fellows Program and Lincoln Fellows Program. Blake has frozen. <laughs> <laughs> Is he still saying flattering things about me? Greatly influenced on American scholarship and debate. Dr. Kessler is the author of I Am the Change, Barack Obama and the Crisis of Liberalism, and the editor of Saving the Revolution, The Federalist Papers and the American Founding. Dr. Kessler's edition of The Federalist Papers, which if you haven't noticed is the book we use in this class, is the best-selling edition of the work. His lecture today is entitled, How to Think About the Federalist. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Charles Kessler. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Blake. I appreciate that uh, kind introduction. Or, uh, I, I heard most of it. I didn't hear every word, but it, it, it seemed very nice. Thank you. Uh, and thanks, for, thanks to Soren for hosting this uh, directly and to, um, uh, of course, uh, Dr. Munoz and the Tocqueville program for the uh, very kind invitation, which they actually issued last year. And uh, I was originally going to give this talk um, last uh, fall, I guess. Um, but I couldn't get to, uh, <laughs> then, then we had a problem. It wasn't yet um, a pandemic, it was just bad weather. And so my flight was uh, delayed and I couldn't get there in time. But I'm glad uh, to obtrude on uh, Dr. Rodriguez's time and his class and my thanks to him as well. Uh, in order to um, give this lecture or a slightly different version of it now uh, for um, this course. So um, the subject is how to think about the Federalist and we're going second. to have several sessions. Can I, can I ask you to pause for a second? Yes. Um, I just want to make sure I'm getting a message that um, some people can't hear us. So if you don't mind just waiting one more second. Um, sure. If you want, I could do this with flashcards. You know, I could just <laughs> prepare a few. <laughs> we'll have that for next time. Republicanism, you know. <laughs> Natural rights. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um... All right, we'll go ahead and keep going. Thank you, thank you for waiting. All right, sure. So I, I'm sorry this has to be on Zoom um, rather than in person, uh, but uh, such are the times uh, we live in. Um, I know it's, a little, it's awkward to do it on Zoom and it's hard to ask questions on Zoom, but we're going to have a few, uh, 10 or 15 or 20 minutes at the end just for questions. So um, if, you, if you have a question, probably try to ask it then, I guess. Um, anyway, um, how to think about the Federalists. So you're going to, you have several sessions to actually closely examine um, some of the Federalist papers and their arguments. And uh, if we have time at the end, I'm gonna say something about Federalist 1 and Federalist 9, which are the two numbers that are 
linked to this uh, to, uh, to today uh, to today's class. But but I want to give a sort of more general introduction to the Federalists. That's the brunt, of really, what I have to say. So. Um, if you think about the founders um, as um, an amazing group of political statesmen who are also intellectuals, uh, who are also writers, they wrote, of course, the world's first declaration of independence. They wrote a constitution, bills of rights, state constitutions, laws, state papers, letters, diaries, speeches, um, but they only wrote a handful of books. And I want to reflect a little bit about that fact. Most founders of most countries are, of course, too busy uh, to write books, even if they had the, the itch, the inclination to write, the cacoethes scribendi, as they say. So if you think about our founders, though, there are, they produced a fair number of books for such a politically busy a group of statesmen. Thomas Jefferson wrote a single slender volume. He's a one book author, uh, which he privately published called Notes on the State of Virginia, which was a very Jeffersonian celebration of natural philosophy and political philosophy. He was responding to a series of questions that a French uh, naturalist had put to him or indirectly to him. And so he wrote up his answers and published it as a book. Uh, and that was the only book he ever published. Uh, James Wilson, who was one of uh, the most active founders, uh, who became a, a justice of the Supreme Court once that was established, um, gave a series of lectures on law that he then published as a two volume treatise a sort of combination of Scottish uh, moral philosophy and updated Blackstone, the British legal writer, uh, and American natural rights doctrine. And uh, th those two volumes are still in print, uh, and they remain very much worth reading, especially in those two volumes, you have one of the longest accounts of natural rights, natural law, social contract uh, theory, um, uh, of any of the founders or framers. Um, there's one woman uh, in the founding generation, M Mercy Warren, uh, who also wrote a book, A History of the American Revolution, uh, which is uh, um, a little anti-federalist in its sentiments, but still very much worth reading as well. Though I suppose by definition, or at least by a uh, by sexist definition, she's not a founding father um, per se, but she, maybe she's a founding mother. Um, John Marshall, the famous Supreme Court Justice, uh, also wrote a massive five volume biography of George Washington, um, which is a classic. And he sort of spent the rest of his life trying to condense it. <laughs> and he, he did, he produced eventually a two volume version of the life of George Washington and, and towards uh, the end of his life, a one volume version of the life of George Washington. Um, this is also a book uh, well worth reading. It's one of the few um, um, biographical writings by one of the framers and it, uh, it uses Cicero actually at some crucial times in its uh, account of Washington to explain Washington's um, amazing commitment to duty, um, his willingness, you know, to serve, to leave home, a, a very nice home, you know, Mount Vernon, which is still there. You can still visit it, assuming COVID-19 or COVID-20 or COVID-21 lets you uh, do that. Um, but he does turn to Cicero and to Cicero's book on duties, the De Officiis, to sort of explain George Washington's character. It's an interesting example of, of one of the founders actually using classical political science to explain what he was seeing in front of him uh, in 18th century life. And of course, there's Benjamin Franklin. Um, he wrote countless newspaper articles and almanacs, 
um, and one book um, on his favorite subject, um, himself. Uh, his autobiography was really less about his own real life than it was about the image of his life that he wanted to leave behind and that he wanted to propagate to sort of influence other Americans and get them um, 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 to become civic spirited uh, in something like the way he was and to learn the art of organizing with your fellow Americans uh, into voluntary associations to go out and do good uh, in your community. And he did a lot of good in Philadelphia. That was the city that he really sort of um, organized the whole voluntary sector, you know, the volunteer fire department, the first lending library, uh, lots of things, lots of projects which were civilian and were driven by a kind of um, a, a new kind of public spiritedness, not from the top down, as in say most of the European countries of that era, but from the bottom up in a way that sort of anticipates Tocqueville and Tocqueville's concern for associations and the art of associations, which you'll be reading about, I think, later on uh, in this course. And um, there's a minor founder, uh, Benjamin Rush, who was a physician and a patriot uh, physician, you might say, who wrote numerous medical treatises, including one on, the most famous one is on bloodletting, you know, putting those little critters on you so you bleed, into you, they suck the blood out of you. That uh, He was a big fan of that. Uh, and he wrote a treatise uh, describing how it should be done and when um, it should be done. But he also wrote a volume of essays, uh, literary, moral, and philosophical. And finally, there's John Adams, who's sort of in his own class. Um, Adams turned out three massive volumes um, called A Defense of the Constitutions of Government of the United States of America when he was in Paris, um, 1787, 1788. He was not um, at the Constitutional Convention. He was um, engaged as a diplomat abroad uh, at the time. And he added a fourth volume to this when he was vice president a decade or so later uh, called Discourses on the Villa. You know, Samuel Johnston famously said of John Milton's Paradise Lost, uh, lost a quote, none ever wished it longer, unquote. Um, and it, it is a great work, Paradise Lost, but none ever wished it longer. And the same thing could be said of John Adams's treatises on political science, most of which it turns out he borrowed from other writers. If you actually look at the books, which I don't recommend necessarily, um, hundreds of pages are lifted from Adam Smith, from histories of Florence, from all kinds of secondary sources, uh, because his own excuse, Adam's excuse was he didn't have time to uh, do his own you know, research and he, but these people had nice people had written stuff that he approved of, and so he just imported it into his um, massive three volumes. But mostly the founders were not book writers. Uh, George Washington, Alexander Hamilton, I mean, he, he has a musical written about him, but he was not himself a, a book writer. Madison did not write a book, uh, Patrick Henry, Sam Adams, most of the others uh, were, you might say, bookless. Uh, they had, of course, read a lot of books, but they did not write any. But then there is our book, uh, The Federalist, or the, the Federalist Papers, written, as you know, under the pseudonym of this Roman uh, founder of the Roman Republic, uh, Publius. This book is the most famous book, with the possible exception of Franklin's autobiography, to come out of the founder's generation. Uh, and it's the book generally acknowledged to be America's only contribution, as Clinton Rossiter once put it, um, to the short shelf of classic works of political philosophy. It's really the only, it's still the only American book probably on that short shelf. Um, Tocqueville's Democracy in America is there, but of course he was a Frenchman. 
Um, and so um, he may be an honorary American, but he doesn't quite count uh, as, an, as an American. Um, and the Federalists' uh, greatness was acknowledged at the time. George Washington and Thomas Jefferson both had very flattering things to say um, when they received their complimentary copy of the Federalist Papers. These were two of the few Am Americans outside of the authors themselves uh, who knew who the authors were behind that pseudonym of Publius. And Jefferson said, for example, this is the best commentary on the principles of government which has ever been written. The best commentary on the principles of government which ever has been written. So high praise indeed. So let me, let's talk about the, the quality and the dilemmas or questions that arise from this book um, being the book that it is. First of all, as, as you know, it was originally not a book, it was a series of newspaper columns. Uh, and so one wonders, does it cohere as a book? Um, isn't it just a hasty assemblage of partisan arguments to secure the ratification of the Constitution in the state of New York, which is where Madison, Hamilton, and Jay, the three actual authors, were all uh, living at the time. Um, well, there's no question that it did first appear in newspapers and that what the, the uh, columns were composed very quickly, um, probably at the rate of about a thousand words a day at the peak of the series. There were sometimes three or four Federalist Papers per week appearing in the New York press. That meant a thousand words a day. So that's four double spaced typed pages a day being turned out by these, these authors. One doesn't think of classic books, you know, being turned out under such deadline pressure, but uh, this one was. But there's a difference, a big difference, be between writing quickly and writing hastily. Um, the Federalist Papers were written quickly, um, but they were on subjects that their authors knew very well, had um, argued in the Federal Convention long beforehand, and of course they, they had all been deeply involved in political affairs for years. So they had a kind of preparation that made it almost impossible for them to write anything about politics or current affairs that could really be described as hasty. They had thought about these issues long before they wrote about them in the Federalists. They did write quickly, but they didn't write hastily. There's a famous letter from Madison in which he says that um, uh, he describes writing the last words of one of his Federalist papers as the boy from the uh, newspaper was at the door waiting for the copy. So, you know, Madison didn't have time to, to um, go over it again to edit it. He finished it, he gave it to the boy, the boy took it to the newspaper and it was in print the next day, probably, or maybe later that afternoon. Um, so all of that is true, and it, but in a way it only makes the Federalists more remarkable um, that more than 200 years later we're still reading it, even though it was written under such deadline pressure. Now, Here's another question about the, you might say, the quality, the character of this book. It has three authors. Uh, of course, the public at the time didn't know that. They only knew it was written by whoever was masquerading as Mr. Publius um, in the New York papers. Um, we know that Alexander Hamilton, it was Alexander Hamilton's idea. He assembled the crew to write the Federalist. It, he knew he couldn't do it all because he wanted to, to publish a comprehensive answer to the anti-federalist uh, arguments against the Constitution. And there were a lot of these arguments and he couldn't do it himself. So he needed allies, he needed fellow authors. Um, he got Madison because Madison was attending he, as a Virginia delegate, the Congress then meeting in New York, the Articles of Confederation Congress. 
And so Madison and Hamilton were together for six months in New York uh, at the height of the series of, um, of the Federalists. Uh, unfortunately, we don't know because they were in the same city. They didn't, have, they didn't write letters to each other. We have no record of how often they actually interacted or what they said to each other or you know, whether they read each other's copy, whether they edited each other's copy, whether they talked about the direction of the newspaper series, we just don't know. Um, it would be interesting to find out, but I, I don't think we shall. And then the third author who was the oldest and the most widely known in his own right, John Jay, um, who was a well-known lawyer, he was a diplomat, and he was the major author of the New York Constitution which had just been adopted uh, in the preceding decade. So together they were um, Publius. Um, and we know, you know, if you know anything about Rome or Latin, you know that they're, it's very confusing because there are only about 15 first names uh, for men in Latin, in classical Latin. Everybody, you know, is, uh, is, is a Publius or a, or a Lucius or a Marcus or uh, there, there's not a lot of variety. So which Publius is this since we've only got his, his first name? Um, well, again, thanks to, to a letter um, much later from Madison, we know for sure what everyone, I guess, sort of suspected that this Publius is Publius Valerius, who was one of the founders of the Roman Republic. Um, if you ever read Machiavelli's uh, discourses on Livy. You know he talks a lot there about Brutus, uh, Lucius Junius Brutus, who was sort of the main founder of the Roman Republic way back when. Um, Machiavelli goes on and on about Brutus because he, uh, he, makes, um, um, he makes him a kind of emblematic founder. And he's very impressed with one late, one action of, uh, of Brutus in his founding career, which was to order the execution of his two sons, of his own sons, because they had plotted against him and the new Republican order. They were apparently trying to bring back the exiled king that Brutus himself had kicked out. So Machiavelli makes a kind of slogan of this, to kill the sons of Brutus. And from, from Machiavelli's point of view, that's political seriousness. Um, you know, that shows you what it takes to found and to make a new legal order, to make a new beginning. You have to be willing to kill the sons of Brutus, your own sons, in order for the Republic to live. Um, but the Americans are more impressed by, as it were, Brutus's partner in founding, uh, namely, Publius Valerius. And this Publius is, our Publius, the American Publius, is named after that Roman Publius, who was also there at the beginning and who survived um, beyond um, uh, Brutus's death uh, and was the sole consul of Rome for a while and used that extraordinary singular power he had because Rome so hated kings that they made a dual executive for themselves. You know, the Republic always had two consuls who served one year uh, at, at the same time. And it was always an interesting problem to divide up consular authority in some way. But one, when Brutus died early in the Roman Republic, it left our guy Publius in the odd position of being the, the singular ruler of Rome again. But he didn't take it back to monarchy, or he didn't try to make himself king or tyrant. Instead, what he did was use that exceptional authority to broaden the democracy, to stabilize it. Um, he, introdu he introduced um, a, various kinds of legal reforms. He lowered taxes. He did all kinds of things to make the, uh, the nascent republic more popular, more stable, uh, and a better, more enduring form of government. And in a way, what the American Publius, our writers, were trying to do is something similar to that in America, to take a republic that was already in existence, 
but in a way refound it to make it more stable, more enduring, more uh, thoughtful, more uh, productive of good government, not just majority rule or popular um, popular government, but popular and good government at the same time. Um, because as you know, we already had one national constitution called the Articles of Confederation, which had come into effect in 1781. Um, the Constitutional Convention, uh, whose handiwork Publius is defending, was only six years later, 1787. Um, Americans like to think of their political history as a, as a kind of success from the very beginning you know, peaceful, successful, uh, enduring. But the fact is our first constitution was a failure and it was rejected within six years, basically. And what we regard as sort of the um, amazing wisdom and, and I suppose effectiveness of our constitution is really of our second constitution. But it was part of Publius's strategy to make you forget the first and to make this the American constitution. We'll talk a little bit more about, about that um, in a minute. All right, but um, as a book, having three authors uh, is an awkward thing. Does it, as several scholars have argued, does it suffer from a case of schizophrenia? Um, is the book divided against itself because it has had uh, two principal authors, three authors uh, in all? Um, I would argue it isn't. Um, even though you had three authors, in a way, they had, it's still the work of a single pen, even if that pen was passed from hand to hand. Uh, among three able writers. And one sign of this is the difficult resolution of the so-called authorship question. You know, uh, both Madison and Hamilton left lists of the numbers of the Federalists that they wrote. Hamilton's list was written hastily because he had a duel to go to. Um, Madison's list was written much later in his life and he had all the time in the world to, to think about things and to come up with his list of uh, the federal papers he wrote. The problem is the two lists conflict uh, in about five or six numbers of the Federalist Papers. They mutually claim them um, as exclusively their own. So they both can't be right. They do acknowledge some of them, they do acknowledge they're ones that they both worked on. That's not a problem. It's the ones that claimed singularly uh, that conflict with each other that form the problem. Um, and so in the 20th century, and even in the 21st century, as you might imagine, computers, uh, algorithms, statistical programs of various kinds have been set to work to try to figure out who wrote what, who wrote which of these mutually claimed Federalist Papers. And I'm glad to report to you, uh, report to you that the computer algorithms don't know. Um, they were, they're, they're basically inconclusive. They can't tell the difference between the styles of Madison and the style and Hamilton. When the computer sets, you know, to count the frequency of various words, the length of sentences, um, you know, the use of active versus passive verbs. I mean, they've used every kind of statistical screen you might imagine. But it turns out, I think, that the all three men wrote to a common standard. They all wrote like Publius. They all deviated from, you might say, their most personal quirks in writing to take up a, a, a common personality of this American Publius. They wrote to a sort of common uh, standard. And in that sense, you could say, the Federalist is a sort of reenactment in, in miniature of the miracle of the Philadelphia Convention itself. You know, you've got all of these, these 55 very smart, accomplished um, individual thinkers together in the in Independence Hall 
uh, in Philadelphia, and they came out with a document which they unanimously agreed to. And that's a kind of, you know, that's Catherine Drinker Bauer wrote a famous book many decades ago called Miracle, The Miracle of Philadelphia, which was about that convention, being able to agree. Of course, it wasn't, the, the truth is it wasn't quite unanimous because three members of the convention re refused to sign um, and they left uh, without signing it. I'm not sure whether they are therefore um, levers, uh, in, to put it in British parlance, or remainers, because they wanted to remain with the Articles Confederation, but they left the convention. So uh, I don't know, they're levers and remainers uh, in some complicated sense. Um, but nonetheless, the, even if it wasn't, you might say, entirely unanimous, it was everyone who stayed signed. Uh, and that was 39, the vast uh, majority. So you can say that the Federalist represents the common ground on which Hamilton, Madison, and Jay could meet. You know, what they agreed uh, needed to be said at that moment in order to save the country uh, from anarchy or tyranny, uh, in order to secure the future safety and happiness uh, of the country. But this uh, common ground was not a least common denominator. Uh, and so I want to say something now about what it is that they um, were trying to do when they wrote to the Federalist. Um, one should bear in mind that the, the Constitution had already been adopted f formally um, by the time uh, most of the Federalists would appear. Um, according to Article 7, you know, which is the last article of the Constitution, uh, it takes only nine states of the 13 to ratify the new Constitution. Well, not long after the Federalists began publishing, nine states succeeded in ratifying it. Technically, it was not long into the Federalists' publication that um, they had succeeded in a certain sense. The Constitution had been adopted by uh, uh, the Union. <clears throat> but as long as New York and Virginia had not adopted it, it, it was not regarded as viable. So you had to get New York, Hamilton's home and Jay's home, and you had to get Virginia, which was Madison's home. So in a way, ratification was not the issue. Um, I mean, it still was an issue, and the the vote in Virginia and in New York was fairly close, which is why the the Federalist, um, you know, may have uh, it may not have swayed many votes, but it may have swayed enough to make a difference. We don't really know. I'll tell you, in the Virginia ratification, which was on June twenty fifth, um, seventeen eighty eight. Uh, was by 89 to 79 votes. So that was pretty close. Most of the states voted overwhelmingly for the Constitution. But New York's, New York voted in July 26, on the 26th of July, 1788. 30 to 27. So a very close vote uh, in the New York ratifying convention. New York would be the 11th state to ratify um, the Constitution, but you didn't really have a, con a viable union if you didn't have New York and Virginia, which were the most um, um, populous states and in some ways the most powerful states. And when you think of Virginia, by the way, you have to think not of the current state of Virginia, but of, I mean, Virginia was Virginia and what we now call West Virginia and Kentucky. All of that was in the state of Virginia at the time. So it was a much bigger state, just physically, you know, in terms of square miles and population than we might think of it. But my point really is that the fight, uh, the political fight was shifting from the bare ratification of the constitution to how the constitution was going to be administered once it had been ratified and put into 
uh, effect and the first federal elections had been scheduled. In other words, the fight was switching really to how to interpret the Constitution. What was the Constitution going to actually mean when it was put into effect? And depending on how you interpreted it, you could have had many very different kinds of Republican outcomes. You could have had very different, you know, Americas, very different countries, depending on how you interpreted the role of the president, the role of the Supreme Court, um, the role of Congress, and many other, the role of federalism. All of these were, you know, the Constitution says something about each of them, but it's pretty bare bones. And so what spin you put on it, how are you going to interpret the bare bones of the Constitution is really what, in a way, the Federalist was trying to influence. Um, and I won't be giving anything away to say that the, the, the Federalist wants to give a, um, uh, an interpretation that is very friendly to the nation. Uh, you know, you, it, it, it certainly doesn't ignore the states, but the point of the Federalists was to defend a firmer union and a new, much more powerful central government than had been in, in existence under the Articles of Confederation. It was in its own context a centralizing doc, doc, doctrine. It's, it, it centralized more authority in a new national government and it changed the nature of the union because it took away some powers from the state governments and gave them to uh, the federal, the new federal government. It also created a, a limited government. I mean, it didn't allow the federal government to do whatever it wanted, but it did want the federal government to have more authority, more power in certain areas which were needful and which were uh, in fact indispensable to national integrity and national success, its authors thought. So I would argue that the Federalist was in a way so successful in imparting its spin to the Constitution that when we read the Constitution now, we tend to read it the way Fed Publius taught us to read it without even knowing it. Uh, so great has been the book's enduring influence that it's hard for us to see its strategy. Um, so let me try to unpack that strategy for just a moment. Um, if, we, if we read the Constitution or try to innocently, that is, if we take off the glasses that the Federalist Papers uh, gave us with which to read the Constitution. Um, the document looks a little bit different, or at least potentially different from the one that we are familiar with. Um, you probably know already, for example, that the term judicial review does not appear in the Constitution. Um, there is in Article 3 a, a description of the federal courts and of the Supreme, well actually only of the Supreme Court, but um, what its job is exactly, how extensive its powers are, and in particular, whether it and how it can overrule congressional law, congressional acts, uh, is all very up in the air. Nothing specific about them. But when we think of the Constitution, probably one of the most characteristic things we think about is uh, judicial review and the Supreme Court. Um, the Philadelphia Constitution, the text, doesn't mention separation of powers or speak of the three branches as equal or coordinate. Of course, Article 1 is on Congress, Article 2 is on the presidency, Article 3 is on the Supreme Court or the judiciary. So there is a kind of obvious departmental separation. But uh, there's, there isn't a theory of the separation, you might say, in, in the, in, in very much evident in the document itself. Congress is the first branch. Uh, and what does that mean? 
is it the most fundamental branch? Is it the most important branch? Is it the most powerful or authoritative branch? Who knows? Um, Congress is given a lot of power uh, and nothing in the Constitution forbids Congress from using that power to the max. Um, I mean, power of the purse or the impeachment power could have been used, um, you know, to force presidents or the Supreme Court to bend to its will because it dislikes the president's policies or because it dislikes a court ruling uh, in particular. Even today, you know, the composition of the Supreme Court is entirely a matter of statute law. Um, you could pack the Supreme Court anytime you had a president and a Congress who wanted to. You could change the size. You know, we have nine, we've had nine Supreme Court justices for a very long time, but that's set by law. There's nothing in the Constitution about how many Supreme Court justices uh, you're supposed to have. And it's, it's fluctuated. In the 19th century, the number went up and down a couple of times before settling on um, nine. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt famously had a court packing plan, which he was pushing in 1938, which didn't uh, succeed, although it, it, in a way it did succeed in turning the court to uh, yield more favorable rulings about the New Deal. Um, Democrats today are, uh, have been talking about, uh, including in their platform, um, increasing the number of justices on the court. Um, you know, Franklin Roosevelt was talking about an age limit um, on Supreme Court justices. There are all kinds of interesting thoughts circulating about what one could do to um, um, bring the court under control, political control. My point is only Americans have always been averse to doing that. Um, we have a kind of reverence for the court and for the Constitution in particular. Where does that come from? Um, in part, I think it is d a deliberate creation of the Federalist Papers, of the kind of argument that they have taught us, the kind of regard they have taught us to have for uh, the Supreme Court and really for the founders, the framers of the Constitution in particular uh, ever since. But let me give you a historical example to sort of um, back up what I'm saying. Let me take you back to 1824. Um, by, I would say by this, by 1824, the Constitution was well on its way to becoming a regime of parliamentary-like supremacy. Um, by this point, this was at the end of the <clears throat> so-called era of good feelings, which you may recall from a high school history book, dimly. Um, the Congress nominated both parties or all the parties um, nominees for president. They had caucuses of the Congress who, who nominated Andrew Jackson uh, to run, who nominated Henry Clay, who nominated uh, uh, John Quincy Adams to run uh, for the presidency in 1824. And then there was um, a stalemate in the, uh, in the Electoral College. Nobody had a majority. And so the, the selection of the president went back by constitutional uh, writ to the House of Representatives. The very people who had nominated the candidates now had to decide which one was going to become president in 1824. <clears throat> um, and of course, uh, uh, they picked John Quincy Adams. Uh, which um, um, Andrew Jackson um, deeply resented, and uh, he accused uh, the Congress of, ha of having a corrupt bargain. You know, getting um, uh, giving the giving the office to um, uh, John Quincy Adams and making Clay Secretary of State. Uh, you know, th that was the essence uh, of the bargain. 
So Jackson, who's kind of like Donald Trump, you know, he, he could get angry. <laughs> and he sometimes rubbed people the wrong way. And when he did, he rubbed harder. <laughs> you know, he's that, that sort of guy some, somewhat. Um, he ran again for the president in 1828. <clears throat> he won it this time. And um, he and Van Buren, his vice president, really created the American party system um, to take the nominating power away from the House and give it back to the um, people, you know, to keep the president independent uh, of Congress. He was, what he was doing was in a way restoring America's constitutional balance um, in, line, <clears throat> in line with the Federalist's own teaching about separation of powers and the independence of the executive. In other words, he was <clears throat> changing the, the system, the political system, to bring it more in line with the Federalist's understanding of the Constitution. But there's nothing in the Constitution per se that says caucuses in the House of Representatives can't nominate candidates for president uh, of political parties. There's nothing in it or against it, uh, per se, in the Constitution. So my point is that our understanding of the Constitution as a system of checks and balances, separation of powers, judicial review, federal balance, a few and infrequent amendments of um, distributed and moderated and above all constitutional majorities, as Lincoln called them, in compliance with the cool and deliberate sense of the people, and that means the whole people, not just the majority, all of these key elements of the way we understand our constitution owe as much or more to the Federalist than to the document itself. The Federalist has taught us to want and to expect these um, aspects of constitutional government, except on the question of the Bill of Rights. Um, the Federalist in Federalist 84 argues against the Bill of Rights, uh, says it's unnecessary that the Constitution is already a Bill of Rights. Um, but in order to get the Constitution passed in Virginia, Madison, who was running that show, um, promised that he himself would introduce a Bill of Rights in the first Congress. He changed his position on it, and that helped to get it passed. But the Bill of Rights that Madison sponsored, and that we finally know as the Bill of Rights, um, is uh, very modest. It's, it is just a Bill of Rights. Most of the Anti-Federalists wanted a lot more than procedural rights. They wanted term limits on the presidency. They wanted to, in some, some of them wanted to reduce the term of the Senate from six years um, to four years, to reduce the House from a two-year term to a one-year term. There were all kinds of structural reforms that went by the name of Bill of Rights that were being debated. So what Madison did was basically, in keeping with the Federalists, himself take over the, the movement to add a Bill of Rights to the Constitution and limit that Bill of Rights to the protection of um, freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom of assembly, um, trial by jury, you know, sort of procedural guarantees mostly of, uh, of rights and no structural alterations in the Constitution at all. So this, this, is, this is, of course, the great political lesson that if you, want, if you want the opposition to do the right thing, you want to run the opposition. <laughs> you don't want to let them you know, do their own thing. You want to subtly make sure they're doing what you want them to do, even when you seem to be conceding to their uh, positions. OK, let me come to my uh, sort of final point, uh, which is what, what is the, the character of the Federalists' teaching about government, about the Constitution. Um, and and I'll, I'll just tick off a 
uh, a list here of, uh, of a few things which you can pay attention to as you actually begin to read um, The Federalist in uh, detail in the coming week or so. First of all, um, what, the, what the Federalist does and does beautifully is to is to extract from the bundle of compromises that produce the Constitution in the convention, a constitutionalism. In other words, the Federalist shows the document is not just a sort of incoherent bunch of proposals slapped together. Um, there's a reason to it. There's a doctrine that unifies it. There's a kind of wisdom in the Constitution which Publius extracts and teaches us um, directly. Uh, that wisdom, that is the interpretation, the spin uh, that Federalist gives the Constitution and has given us in a way uh, ever since. What Publius does is show you that the Constitution could be, is coherent enough to be the product of one mind, as though you could give an account of it, and therefore one, mi one man's mind could conceivably have legislated it all in accordance with that intent. In other words, what, um, um, uh, many observers have called the cult of the Constitution, the sort of the worship of the Constitution in American politics, is something that Publius uh, is strategizing towards. It's a goal of his that we can that we uh, can see um, that this is the product. The, the Constitution is a product of a founding or of a founder. Now, um, Publius actually discusses foundings in thirty-seven through forty. I don't know if you're reading. Uh, those any of those particular numbers or not, but that little section is about comparing uh, ancient foundings to America's founding. And what was characteristic, he argues, of ancient foundings, one of the things characteristic of it was that they were the work of one man, one founder, you know, Lycurgus in Sparta, or Romulus in Rome, um, and even say Solon, the democratic founder of Athens. Uh, but America was founded by committee. Uh, you know, the Declaration of Independence is signed by uh, multiple people. The Constitution uh, is signed by uh, 39 people. The, the convention had 55 members. Um, we don't have one great founder. We have founding fathers, you know, maybe we have, but that's a set, a plurality. But yet what Publius teaches us is that in a way the Constitution is what Publius has taught us to say it is. So Publius in a sense becomes a kind of founder, the one man whose mind we now see permeating the Constitution and behind the Constitution. So to the extent that we look up, look up to the Constitution as something wise, uh, as something, you know, well thought through, deeply, profoundly thought through. That's what Publius wants us to think of it. And he tries to show you how you can give an account of it, which defends all of these things, which were actually many of them adopted in the spirit of compromise. They were not principles exactly until they were adopted and Publius helps to flesh out what is principled about them. So Publius gives us one possible interpretation of the document, not the only one, however, but the one that is needed, he thinks, to make Republican government evolve into good government, meaning a, gov a government that secures individual rights and the common good, and that operates with the consent of the government. And one that will also produce a, an energetic, and strong union, because the Federalist is about really two subjects. The first one is union, why we need to stay together as one country and not split up into two or three. And then secondly, why the Constitution is a better form of Republican government than the state 
constitutions. So he has, in, he criticizes in the first part of the Federalist, the first volume, the target is really the Articles of Confederation. It's weak form of federation or federalism. But the target in the second part is, is the nature of Republican government. It's the state constitutions that are really um, coming in for a kind of criticism. So if you want to talk about a, not just a cult, but a culture of constitutionalism, I think that is really what Publis is trying to imbue. You know, in Federalist 49, which I'm sure you are reading, uh, he speaks of the necessity for reverence for the law and veneration for the Constitution. These are sort of quasi-religious words, you know, that bespeak... Um, uh, respect with a, a tinge of awe thrown in. He wants us to look up to the Constitution with a certain kind of respect or reverence uh, or even veneration. Um, and um, his success in persuading us to do that um, is a sly and it's so sly that you, you, uh, you, one has to really point it out for us to see it. Um, because from, this is what the subject 49 is, from the point of view of Republican theory, after all, the authority of the Constitution comes only from the fact that the people adopt it. So why should we look up to a document that we ourselves adopt? Aren't we above the document, since we are the ones who make it official, who give our consent to it? But in a way, the genius of the, of the Constitution, as Publius interprets it, is that we, even though we, it's our handiwork, we become its um, children or its followers. Um, we look up to it, and it's only that sort of um, respect that allows the Constitution to be a higher law than mere statute law. You know, and if you're thinking about why, why is it that the uh, Constitution is so hard to amend? Why is it that um, um, the Supreme Court has the power to strike down laws that have been democratically passed by the House and the Senate and signed by the President? if the court finds those laws um, violate the Constitution as such. It's only because the people's will is embodied in the Constitution, but so is their reason. And the reason of the public in the form of the Constitution and a public opinion that looks up to that Constitution is sort of permanently um, above the passions of the people at any given moment, and the, and the laws that our hirelings, our representatives, vote for. We have to square the government with the Constitution, not the Constitution with the government. And that's because the, we think the Constitution is wiser, older, more venerable, more respectable than even the latest laws that have been passed sometimes by overwhelming majorities in the House and Senate and signed by the president. Um, it's, uh, it's what you might call a constitutional morality, which follows from the reverence uh, for the constitution and the, and the founders, which really has shaped the American way of life in profound ways. So even when we have very deep and passionate political disagreements like about abortion or about uh, you know, COVID-19 lockdowns or whatever, um, almost no Americans say the way to solve this is to you know, do away with the Supreme Court and judicial review or to adopt a new constitution altogether. Um, we look up to and accept that frame. And we're willing to, in a way, share a statesman's understanding 
of Republican government, that there are some things which for our own good, we're, we make it very hard for us to do or forbid us to do. And so this constitutional morality was intended by Publius to shape future generations of Americans. It is a, it's a, it's a civic education in effect. So it's precisely this component or dimension of the founding that uh, progressive thinkers, you know, more than a hundred years later, rejected um, adamantly. Um, it's not so much the Constitution, but the spirit of the Constitution that Woodrow Wilson and Herbert Crowley, whom you'll be reading later in this course, uh, objected to and sought to overcome and transform. Um, they wanted to open the Constitution, to fill it with a new spirit, uh, a spirit of progress, of openness to new needs, new problems, new eras, new commandments. Um, and it's also this sort of high tone dimension of it um, that some critics on the right um, don't see in our constitutional system. So Patrick Deneen, esteemed Notre Dame professor, um, whose book, Why Liberalism Failed, answer because it succeeded, um, in, in a way f uh, follows the progressives in thinking that um, the Federalists' constitutional morality is simply the new science of politics or the Enlightenment, uh, the, you know, the, the radical uh, Enlightenment that follows the moderate um, Enlightenment. But I, I think th that's wrong. I think both um, the Deneen argument and the progressive argument is wrong because it misses the quality of the Federalists as a pedagogical work. Um, as a work designed to prepare the opinions of future American citizens and thus to shape the way we think of our interests and our passions, to square them with the Constitution rather than um, cultivating them against the Constitution or outside of the Constitution. Professor Tessler, if I may interrupt. I, I'm going to stop, yes. Yeah. I could go on, but I'm not going to, uh, because wonderful. I wanted to have Thank some you. questions, so sorry. Thank you so much. And for everyone who's tuning in, um, if you'd like to ask Professor Kessler a question, we have a few minutes here. We ask that you use the raise hand function, which is under participants, um, and I can then call on you and mm. unmute you, and then you can ask your question. Um, we also have a tradition here in the program of starting with undergraduate student questions. So if any of our students would like to go first, um, please raise your hand. And by raise your hand, your hand you mean physically raise your hand? Or push the button that says push. raise my hand. Good question. Oh. Push the button that says oh, raise either. my hand. Yeah. Okay. Do you have anyone who would like to go first? All right. Okay. We have um, one of our guests. I'm going to go ahead and unmute him, and he can answer his, ask his question. We ask that you also introduce yourself briefly, if that's all right. Go ahead. Hi. I'm, my name is Douglas Johnson, and uh, I'm in Chicago. And I had a question about um, uh, when you're, you're talking about the veneration of the Constitution, and I'd just like to put it in the context of the the, the Christian Church, and you know, and, and the mind of Christians, and I I would assume at that at that time, um, that was what people would hold God in the highest esteem. And I guess my question is: is how important is that? Or is it, do you think it's important at all in the veneration of the Constitution? And without that, uh, without the, the Christian foundation, does it make much of a, how does that affect the, the veneration of the Constitution or should it? Um, well, it, uh, it, it, it does definitely have um, uh, an effect because the, uh, the notion of, um, uh, of, of higher law 
uh, is powerfully reinforced by Christianity, of course, uh, by the consciousness that there is a, a divine law and a natural law that are superior to human law. I mean, you still need and always need human law, but that human law ought to look to um, an objective moral order to be uh, informed and to be shaped by that moral order. Uh, and Christianity, which gives you, um, as I say, both divine law and at least in the especially, but not only in the Catholic version of Christianity, natural law too, as an authoritative uh, form of higher law, helps basically to make the notion of constitutional law as a form of higher law intelligible. Constitutional law is not divine law, it's not, nor is it uh, exactly natural law, but it shares some of their prestige and it looks, it, it shares, especially wants to share the, the habit of looking up um, so that human passions and preferences are not a law unto themselves. They have to be justified uh, by something above them, by something higher than mere human will or mere majority will. And in that sense, you could say, yes, uh, Christian civilization is a, is a, uh, a highly relevant um, um, part of the founding story. Tom Murphy? You can go ahead. Uh, yeah. Yes, hi, I'm, uh, I'm Tom Murphy. I'm a senior here uh, at Notre Dame's Program of Liberal Studies, which is our great books program. Um, you spoke a bit about how um, the Federalists' papers sought to give meaning to the structure of the Constitution and how, uh, you know, that was a change really to be more of a, a union, more of a nationalist uh, structure and meaning than the Federalist Papers. I was wondering if you could expand a bit on what that change meant when you said uh, that it was designed to prepare opinions for future Americans, how that meaning kind of changed from the Federalist for future Americans or from the articles to uh, the new constitution? Well, um, there are two kinds, there are two changes. That's a good question. There are changes on two levels. One is about rep federalism and one is about republicanism. Both are uh, changed. Federalism is the most obvious change because um, for the Articles of Confederation, um, a, a, a confederation means um, is, is sort of a diplomatic arrangement among, among sovereign powers. You know, they come together for mutual defense or usually something like that, maybe trade as well, but their internal affairs are entirely their own matter. The only thing that they share in common really is the, um, uh, you know, is a common foreign policy and maybe trade policy, as I say. Um, the, uh, the Constitution and the Federalists teach us to think of federalism as uh, very different from that. Federalism is now two layers of government in which neither layer is sovereign, but the people are sovereign and they authorize both of them. And in certain respects, the, the national government uh, has priority uh, over the state governments. And that's a new, that's a, you know, in Federalist 39, Madison calls this a partly federal, partly national arrangement, using the old definition of federalism that the anti-federalists uh, hewed to and that the articles hewed to as well. But what happens really is that the, the federalist produces a new definition of federalism, which is the one that we think of when we think of federal, federalism now. We had to invent a distinction between confederation and, and federalism, which didn't exist uh, basically at the time. But the more complicated changes in republicanism, I'll just, I'll just sketch it. I mean, remember that under the Articles of Confederation, there's no presidency. There's no executive power at the national level. There's no court, Supreme Court, or any federal courts. There's no judicial power. There's only um, legislative power, but it's not really so much a legislature um, for the following reasons. There's, there's a one house Congress under the Articles of Confederation. Every state gets one vote. 
in keeping with the nature of, of a federation. And um, important things, all important votes require nine of 13 uh, to pass um, a, a, a law. Uh, and so it's, uh, to amend the Articles of Confederation requires unanimous consent among the 13 states, not, not in the Congress, but back in their state houses. So it's not a system designed really to pass laws. It's not designed to legislate a lot. What it's designed to be is a kind of diplomatic assembly, a conclave, um, where only un in cases of extreme emergency will the states do much together, you know, do much legislating, really. Uh, and that's how it was designed. I mean, if you think of the use of the term Congress, at the time, if you think of things like the Congress of Vienna, you know, then and later, it's a, a Congress is a diplomatic conclave where you're not there to make laws, you're to make treaties. You know, and you don't need to make many treaties. You usually only come together in cases of war, peace, depression, something major um, needing, you know, that needs to be fixed uh, or needs to be accomplished. And that was really, um, you know, all the, all, all the real governing was left to the states. And the change in republicanism that the Constitution um, evinces is all of a sudden now you've got a two-house legislature, you've got a Supreme Court and a whole series of lesser federal courts, and you've got a powerful president with a four-year term. And that, that looks very different as a national government. And that's, that's the beginning of that uh, change. I think we have time for one more question. Um, Lynn Varco. Lynn, are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? Oh, there we go. Great. Uh, thank you for the talk, uh, Mr. Kessler. Uh, when speaking of the Federalist Papers, it's natural, of course, to reference the Constitution, which you just did, the structure, the purpose. But can you talk about to what degree the Declaration influenced the thinking of the writers of the Federalist? And to what degree you can say America has a declarational soul, or do we have a constitutional soul? <laughs> um, okay, thank you, Lynn. That's a good question. Uh, well, you know, the, the, the um, Federalist Papers um, mentions, uh, cites the Declaration of Independence once in Federalist 43, but it refers to it many times, um, importantly, for example, in Federalist 40, but many, many other times too. Um, uh, I think that um, their own understanding is that, in the Federalist, I mean, is that they're out to construct a system uh, and defend a system of government that can live up to the requirements of the Declaration, that can live up to the uh, commandments, as it were, of the Declaration of Independence, which the ex neither the existing state governments nor the existing confederation under the Articles was able to do. Because after all, the argument against them that the Federalist makes is that there are the state governments are being overwhelmed by majority factions, by tyranny of the majority, and that these small republics, which are supposed to be the most public spirited and pure kind of republican governments according to the um, existing theory and to the anti-federalists understanding, are in fact um, more often than not sinking into corruption. They're not living up to the high mora moral claims or the Republican virtues that supposedly they are um, adept at, um, at teaching their, their citizens. And so if you want to, if you want to um, be able to avoid tyranny, if you want to have individual rights protected, if you want to have the common good um, secured, you've got to have a more high-toned um, form of Republican government. And that's really what the Federalist is about and what it's trying to explain. Why do you need a president? Why do you need um, the ability, why do you need separation of powers um, to limit 
government? Why do you need judicial review uh, to keep the Constitution supreme over statute law? It explains, it re first of all, it raises all those questions. And secondly, it answers them in very uh, persuasive ways. And, and in doing so, it is, in, I think, in its own um, understanding, uh, uh, fulfilling um, the requirements of, uh, of um, a, a moral republicanism that the Declaration of Independence, above all, points to. Well, excellent. Thank you so much for joining us. I think I can speak on behalf of everyone who's silently present that we appreciate you taking the time. Um, well, so thank you everyone for joining us. Thank this you all. Thank you for Zooming with me uh, <laughs> this morning or this afternoon, your time. Yeah. Uh, if, anyway. If anyone missed. I hope to see you all in person someday, but. Uh, next fall. <laughs> we'll bring you back up. Next fall. Okay. Maybe. Yeah. Good. Good. Thank you again. Yeah. And if anyone missed the full lecture, we will have it recorded and put on our both our podcast site and you should be able to find it at constudies.nd.edu. So thank you everyone and have a good day. Au revoir. <laughs>